Hello, everyone. My name is Galen Scott, and I head ENS's IP practice. I'm really pleased that you're able to join us today for a very topical discussion. With metaverses, AI, and NFTs changing the way in which we are all doing business, it is important for us to share with you some of the key intellectual property considerations and risks that we are all now forced to consider. I would like to introduce our speaker, Waldo Stein. Waldo is the head of our commercial IP practice and is recognized as a leader in his field in South Africa. Waldo and his team were responsible for the firm receiving recognition in this field, including winning the awards for South African IP transactions and advisory firm of the year and African IP team of the year, and for receiving a top ranking in the IP transactions category. Please can I ask you to put any questions which you may have in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, and Waldo will deal with them at the end of his presentation. I hand over to you, Waldo, and I hope that uh, everyone will enjoy the session. Galen, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Really glad that you could join us here today. So uh, I'm going to jump straight into the subject here today. Um, and I'm not uh, sharing an agenda with you on everything I'm going to go through. It's going to be focusing on these three key themes, metaverse, artificial intelligence, and um, NFTs. But what I wanted to do as a way of just kicking off the discussion today is to just remind you what it is that we're talking about. So first of all, we are talking today about things like trademarks, copyright, designs, patents, and to some extent, perhaps confidential information. But the key message here is when we think about intellectual property in the context of our discussion today, then these are the forms or, or, or the things that we are talking about. Now, I am going to touch quite a bit on trademarks and copyright in our discussion today, and I will not mention designs again. Um, I'm not going to touch on patents in this discussion. And the reason for that is that there are numerous patents relevant to AI, to NFTs, to the metaverse specifically. And, and that's a such a specialist discussion that if there is a need for that, raise it with us. We'll gladly sort of focus on that as well. But for today's purposes, we're going to focus more on the high level kind of intellectual property rights that you're likely to have to think about and where there may be risks for the business as a result of these sort of changes in our world. Likewise, I will not be touching really on confidential information in this discussion. Now, still at the point of introducing the subject, and as I promised years ago already to myself, colleagues and clients, I want to remind you that what we are talking about today is the most valuable category of assets in the respective businesses where you're involved. So how can I say something like this? This is a graph that shows a study conducted on the S&P 500 companies, and it shows the proportionate value of intellectual property as compared to other assets in these businesses. And as you can see quite graphically there, from the mid-1970s, intellectual property assets grew from around 17, 17% of the total asset value to far more than 90% actually post-2020. So if there is any doubt in your minds that what we're discussing here today is relevant, it is very relevant. We're talking about those most valuable assets of your businesses and how they are being impacted by things like the metaverse, AI, and NFTs. So jumping into the metaverse, first of all, what is it that we're talking about? So we're talking about a virtual reality characterized by persistent virtual worlds that continue to exist even when you're not present. I always sort of get a smile when, when I think about that explanation. It reminds me of philosophy at university, the whole example of a room and the things in a room stopping to exist once you leave it. Now, the whole idea for metaverse that that's, is, that's not the case. It's a place that continues to exist whether you choose to be present at a particular point in time or not. It's a digital environment that uses augmented reality, virtual reality, and blockchain, along with concepts from social media, to create spaces for rich user interaction actions, 
mimicking the real world. So, so the whole idea is to create a space where people can interact as if they're, they're in a kind of a real world. So immediately you must be thinking, well, making new friends, finding new places to sell goods and services. Effectively, a whole new channel is being created or has been created for you to think about reaching customers and consumers. Goldman Sachs actually predicted that the metaverse could represent a business opportunity valued at more than 8 trillion US dollars. So that's by no means anything trivial. So quite often people think like the metaverse thing, it's, it's it, how real is it sort of what is happening there? It's not all that new though. And I want to, I, I like this slide about Second Life. Second Life has been around for 19 years. It's an environment in which people have traded for several years. They design homes, furniture, clothing, all kinds of things that are sold for in-world currency underpinned by real money. And this is an excellent illustration for me that for us who are sitting up now thinking, wow, there is this metaverse thing happening in the world, it's actually been around for a while. And Second Life has been used by businesses, universities, and schools for quite a number of years as a place for their people to meet, to collaborate, to be educated, um, basically to get together as if though they are in the real world. So, so in a sense for me, this is a testimony of a high quality, quality environment that really does create rich user experiences that's been around for a while and I'm sure it's going to be around for, for quite some time still. So two, two big South African corporates have already ventured into the metaverse that, that we're aware of. Um, there's a metaverse called Ubuntu Land. Ubuntu Land is very much focused on Africa. It, it tries to pitch itself as an, an, a first African metaverse. And we saw MTN venturing into this space um, early last year. Um, they've got a property there and they've been busy with some interesting activities in their metaverse space. For example, they launched an invitation only virtual concert in their virtual world, trying to engage with customers and, and stakeholders in a new and different way. Now, remember, this is a company who is putting itself out there as a technology company. It's focusing very much on a range of activities other than just being a telco and its venture into the metaverse is beautifully aligned with its overall strategic goals. So, so that's a space to watch and an example of a South African corporate being in this space active already. I think MTN has done very well. They've actually created a whole new brand. This is in the public domain called Alt MTN to identify their virtual space and, and their metaverse activities. So here we have a, a corporate who is embracing this new channel or opportunity building a new brand equity around it as well. And it's going to be interesting, I think, for all of us to, to watch that space. Um, similar to, to MTN's activity, NetBank Group, definitely sort of first mover as far as financial institutions are concerned, um, embraced Ubuntu Land as well, bought space in Ubuntu Land, and had some really interesting activities around um, so events that they sponsor, for example. So again, you can go, you can have virtual experiences related to golfing, for example, in their metaverse. It ramps up over certain events, of course, um, but again, a fantastic opportunity. Um, someone going out there sort of saying, I'm gonna find a new way to engage with what traditionally maybe have, may have been seen as more conservative customers or, or consumers. So, so this for me, um, sends a message that the metaverse is very much a real opportunity. It's not a theoretical opportunity any longer. So, so let's talk about money for a moment. Nike has been extremely proactive in the metaverse space and they own the RTFK um, T brand. They collaborate, collaborated with um, an artist, Theosius, in a campaign where they actually sort of sold a combination of virtual goods and real goods. And just look at that. In six minutes, and that's correct, 600 pairs of combined shoes and NFTs 
were sold for over 3.1 million US dollars. Now, if, if, if there was any uncertainty whether virtual goods and offering these things for sale in a virtual space has got any credibility, a six minute sale of 3.1 million dollars, 600 pairs, I think that is proof enough that for the right consumer market and the right kind of activity, there is money to be made here. And, and just to sort of kind of underpin that a little bit further, um, JP Morgan actually invested in a payments platform used in Second Life. And that shows you that here we've got a bank saying, I am buying into a payment system currently only used in a virtual environment. I'm not talking about an online payment system generally, I'm talking about very specifically a metaverse related payment system. So continuing on this theme of whether the metaverse is a real thing or not, and whether you should take heed of what's happening there. Interesting enough, in Colombia, they've actually now had court cases heard in um, Meta's Horizon workroom. So here they had a court case taking place in a virtual space where characters look like the ones you see on the screen here. And again, for me, it is confirmation that what may for the moment seem to be sort of isolated instances of corporates buying into the metaverse is not the case at all. And, and, and interesting enough, especially for those of you more sort of towards the, the services kind of industry, articles are pre predicting that you may even find some government related services in metaverses in the future. So what does that mean for us, thinking about the metaverse and intellectual property? And the first thing that really must come to mind for all of us, I think, especially for those with, of you with, with very strong brands, is what does this mean for my trademark portfolio? What does it mean from a trademark infringement perspective? Um, can I own the virtual equities that I create, whether it is a, a receptionist, so an avatar of a person receiving people at my virtual bank, or other equities? Um, what about the infringement of third party rights? Is that something I should still be concerned about, even if this is such a sort of a, a virtual world? And then, of course, enforcement and jurisdiction. So against this background, let's start with trademarks. So Nike has been ahead of the curve here for a while and was one of the first companies that realized that they needed to change the way they protect their trademarks in order to adequately protect virtual goods. What you see on the screen here, and remember this will be shared with you, is the kind of language that they use to, to cover some of the virtual goods that they sell. So, so for those of you who don't appreciate this, Nike is actually, they, they collaborated in, in Roblox. Roblox is a, a, a virtual world, a metaverse, extensively used. If you have children, they're probably playing some kind of game on Roblox at the moment. So it's a platform with a whole wide range of different activities or games. It is so widely used that the Western Cape government has even got a, 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 a gamification promotional campaign to, to try and promote um, the Karua as a tourist destination on, the, on that or in that metaverse. So there, Nike had a store and you could buy Nike branded items for your avatar to wear in that world. Socks, shoes, clothing. Nike did the same thing with Fortnite. So for those of you not familiar with Fortnite, it's an online first-person shooter game. You play it with literally thousands of other players. And how that platform is monetized is by selling skins. So what your, your, your character looked like and what equipment it basically can use. And Nike was right in there as well, selling bundles where your characters could dress in certain Nike branded paraphernalia. This drove, that first mover ability of theirs, drove them to realize that their traditional protection of the Nike trademark and core classes, such as 25 for clothing and 28 for sports equipment, wasn't adequate anymore. So class nine, which typically covered software, for example, look at the description there, downloadable virtual goods, namely, and then they continue to describe it. So now you've got to think, you probably have protection in class nine for apps and things like that. But should you, if you are a FMCG company, for example, is there space for you to sell virtual goods under your, your key brands at some point? The answer is probably going to be yes. Then we look at, at, at uh, 
class of 35 there, for example. So this was typically a retail class. Look what Nike did. They said retail store services featuring virtual goods, namely, and then they named these goods again. So again, if you were thinking, I'm a bank, my key class may be class 36, for example. How, how have you changed your the way that you articulate those services for which you claim exclusive rights in your trademark to keep up with either activities in the metaverse or anticipated activities in the metaverse. And if you're sitting now thinking, yo, well, the, the chances of us moving into this space are really unlikely. Remember, you don't necessarily know how actively the marketing teams are looking at this. You, you, you don't appreciate how quickly the business may have to pivot to go and compete and find other ways to reach customers and consumers. And then let's just look there at class 41 as well. Entertainment services, namely providing online, non-downloadable virtual footwear clothing. Here. So you can see here a complete pivot on the traditional in, in respect of the, the traditional way of thinking about the trademark protection. So following this pivot, the um, European um, Office of, 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 uh, of Intellectual Property Protection did provide some guidance on, on, on how to deal with virtual goods. Um, virtual goods are proper to class nine because they are treated as digital content or images. And I think what we need to do here is challenge ourselves and not only think about virtual goods, but virtual services as well and where we fit that in. Um, the 12th edition of the NIST classification, so that's the classification system to look at trademarks, will incorporate the term downloadable digital files authenticated by NFTs. Um, but it goes further, it says, well, you can't just say NFTs sort of as such, they've got to be linked to something to get protection for that. Okay, so the message here is you have to go back after this presentation and think about the extent to which you are future-proofing your trademark portfolio. So when we think about trademark protection in the metaverse, there are some challenges that come up, not only with respect to the classification only. And one of the most difficult questions to answer is formulating an appropriate trademark protection strategy, actually, where to protect the trademarks for the metaverse. And, and there are typically two key considerations when you think about the filing strategy. You would think, where am I going to use? So in this case, it's metaverse, it's a virtual space. You would typically look at where am I importing from or where do I perceive the greatest risk from or, or of infringements? So if we apply that kind of logic to the metaverse space, one of the things you wouldn't have had to think about previously would be, where's the metaverse owner or operator based? So if you're contracting, for example, with a, a company incorporated in Cyprus for your property in the metaverse, I would strongly urge you to think about Cyprus as a potential place to have to have trademark protection as well, in case ever you need to take action against that operator itself. And then where do you expect the infringement to come from? So with a virtual world, that's a nearly impossible question to answer. Very, very difficult. Um, nevertheless, I think as time progresses and perhaps we see some trends from where infringement may be coming from, um, like we did historically with, with ordinary counterfeit goods and people said, okay, let's file in country A or country B as a preemptive step. We may possibly see that in the future with respect to virtual worlds as well. And then importantly, in contracting for virtual properties in the metaverse, such as, for example, Ubuntu land, it is very important that, that, that those contracts are also reviewed to see if they cater for or provide for any kind of intellectual property protection, takedown mechanism, complaint mechanisms, because you want to be in a space where you can go to a, a virtual world operator, so to speak, and have that as a first port of call to, to enforce or protect some rights. And that would be a contractual issue, an issue in the first instance. So have we seen infringement in the virtual world? Absolutely. There are some wonderful examples of, of, of games where this started. Um, the well-known Call of Duty franchise, for example, faced some claims from, from the, the makers of the Humvee. Um, this is a, a very interesting case. I'm sure that by now you, you would have either read an article about it or have seen this. This US-based artist, Rothschild, created and sold around 100 NFTs 
related to images of Hermes's Birkin bags. So he created these images, these bags in, these, in this format don't exist. He did artistic things to them um, and sold them and made a tremendous amount of money. People were willing to spend an almost unbelievable amount of money to buy a digital image of a bag. And that's what they had, only that dig digital image. So needless to say, Hermes took Mr. Rothschild to, to court in the US because they knew he was based in the US. And he tried to defend the case based on freedom to speech and freedom to sort of artistic freedom, basically. And earlier this year, he got smacked. And the court basically said, listen, this is straight up trademark infringement. What you did here was you knowingly sought to deceive customers and was in reality seeking to pursue a purely financial goal. So, so what is the good news here? The good news here is that your trademarks are definitely enforceable against infringement in a virtual world. But in order to get to that point of enforcement, you need to make sure that your trademarks are properly protected. The correct class, correct jurisdiction, things like that. So for example, in this case, Hermes would have had to take action or they did take action in the US and would have had to rely on US-based registrations. So, so just bear that in mind, this, there isn't a silver bullet here. There's still that element of I've got to go and protect my brand, perhaps slightly wider than I might have thought in the past. Okay, I'm going to move on to a, um, generative AI, which, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, and perhaps before I do that, let me make one last observation on the metaverse. So let me slip back to, no. Um, so, so with respect to the metaverse, I didn't really copy comment on copyright infringement. And, and I think it's important to say that you've got to be wary of copyright ownership and copyright infringement in that space as well. So remember that base document in terms of which you buy property in the metaverse, will have terms and conditions associated with it, or it will contain it, with respect to her, who owns copyright of works created in that environment. Because remember, your brand and marketing teams are going to be building visual elements in that space. You're going to invest in marketing that. You're going to create equity in that. And you want to be sure that that can't be replicated by someone else. So that contractual basis of the relationship becomes critically important. And then as a last point on copyright and metaverses is remember the rules and the principles of copyright will equally apply to a virtual space, just like they do to the internet at the moment. So you still follow the chain of title, who owns the copyright, where's the infringement taking place, jurisdiction for courts on infringement may become more complicated, like in the case of trademarks, but it doesn't now mean there's a new regime where either copyright doesn't apply anymore or where it's not enforceable anymore. It does apply. The same old rules will have to be applied to that environment. And that also means that from your brand agency side and your, your own branding team side, they need to be as careful as they've been up until now in making sure that they do not infringe the rights of third parties. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to move over to artificial intelligence. So generative AI is a form of machine learning that's able to produce text, videos, images, code, a whole range of different things. It's, it's a an amazing world. I had the privilege to sit for two hours with a very senior marketing executive of a very big client of ours two weeks back. And she took me through what they're doing using AI. And it is creating images, doing amazing thing with those images and sharing their plans to build equity in that over the long term. And needless to say, that then raises the question, firstly, for I think all of you in the audience, what are your companies doing at the moment with respect to AI? And if you think, well, Valdu, we're, we're, we've got a policy against it maybe, or no one is using it, I promise you, you are wrong. Anyone from your tech developers to your marketing people to your business development people are probably playing around with or have been playing around with these tools for some time. And there are numerous tools out there. And they're, they're mind-blowing, to be honest with you. So what I'm trying to show with this image that you see here is, in a sense, the pressure points. So in the middle, we've got what I'm trying to represent as the generative AI model. 
you need that thing to learn somehow. So you need big data. They talk about data lakes. And you feed all of this data into this machine learning system, which then creates a set of abilities or rules to be able to be prompted to recreate something. The hand there shows the intervention of the user. So as we sit here, the people in your companies playing around with these tools right now at this moment. And then at the very end, we see an, a product or a deliverable, a image that was created or a talking Tom or a, a something, a piece of code maybe that was created from this, let's call it a value chain for the moment. So why I want to represent it in this way is to show you the two key pressure points. A tremendous amount of litigation is taking place at the moment between the data lake side and the AI side. And I've listed here a few, a few cases going on in the US at the very moment. And what is very interesting is that you can see that, that claimants are trying very hard to protect their turf. Their turf being the ability to generate and create new works. So if we look at the case involving Alphabet Incorporated, for example, um, the, the argument there is made that um, Alphabet scrubbed something like 5 billion images on the internet to create the data to be able to learn its system. And the three artists who brought this, 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 this claim, and it's actually a, a, a class action, they are saying that there is copyright infringement because this AI actually used all of their images as well to create um, an, an, a work at the very end. So, so, so the first pressure point would be um, data owners taking action against the AI sort of um, intellectual property owners to say, well, there, there's an infringement taking place here. And when you start, start drilling down into these cases, it becomes amazingly interesting. So in this case, actually, what happened is that Alphabet said, actually, you know, we never copy these images. So it's not like we draw the images from the internet for our system to learn. It goes and view these images where they are. We never copy them, we never replicate them, and we never keep them. And then what we generate at the other end is something that we are arguing and that they argued is not something where you can any longer draw a line of nexus, so a connection between what we've scrubbed on the internet and what was created by a user of our system. So, so that's quite important. And in one of, in this case specifically, the judge conceded that it wasn't the, the claimants weren't able to show that their particular images out of five billion images were in fact the images that were used in creating a particular outcome by this AI generation. So, so very interesting, so the, the technology, so the, the fact that there was no copying, no replication taking place, and then also almost that statistical element of the vast amount of data used to train the system to then create an, an output. Another one that's, that's very interesting is the Anderson versus Stability AI one. So Stability AI is a system where you can generate code. And Again, I'm pretty sure that a lot of the, the, the tech developers in your organizations are using this in any event. So <laughs> um, Anderson, again, sort of represents, a, sort of a, that's one name, but it's a class action as well. And in this case, they said that, look, Stability AI is copying all of this code and that there's an infringement in that. And that a, at least 1% of the code that is created by, by the AI is identical to what was put into the system to learn. And in, in this case, sort of the, the court found that, look, they, the, 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 the group wasn't able to show that their code was part of that 1% or even that the 1% statistic was actually correct. Um, and in addition to that, and this is very interesting, the way the stability AI works is it doesn't regurgitate. So it doesn't take a sort of something that it used to learn and then spits that out at the other end when it's prompted for a particular functionality. It is learned in such a way that all of the code that it generates every time is unique in some way. And that functionality is critical 
or was critical in this case, when the court considered whether infringement takes place or not. So, so we've seen in both those cases, the way that the system learns and the way that the system is programmed to produce a result was absolutely critical in determining whether there was any infringement. Now, you may think, okay, Walter, but we're talking here sort of on the learning side of the AI. A lot of us are much more concerned about the other side. There where our users, our marketing team and our research and development teams or, or tech development teams are, as we speaking, sitting there and doing their work using these different AI systems. So what are the key pressure points there? Who owns the copyright in the works created through the use of AI tools? What does the terms and conditions say about that? That's the point of departure. So, so in South African law, if we look at SA4 for, for a moment, an AI tool would be seen as a tool used to create work. It's likely to be dealt with as a generated work. And our act, although it's very old, does provide for this type of copyright creation. How it will be interpreted in a case of someone using an AI tool is certainly a question that's still open for determination. Nevertheless, the point of departure always in all of these things must be for you to refer your teams back to the terms and conditions. What do they say? So everyone I'm, I'm, I'm assuming has by now played around with chat GPT, um, written poems, written sort of all kinds of interesting things. Go and have a look at the terms and conditions. So the last time I looked at those, it said that you as the user will own the copyright in the content generated by the system. But here's the interesting thing. I couldn't pick up any language that says you, this copyright is hereby assigned to you, for example. So there's no transfer taking place. There's also no warranty of non-infringement and there's no indemnity sitting behind that sort of apparent ownership of the copyright by the user. So in a case like that, the terms and conditions are crafted in such a way to protect the owners of the system. It creates the, the user with a, 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 or it leaves the user, user with the idea that it, it owns what was created. But enforcing that in a court may be quite challenging, actually. So, so let's make that relevant to business for a moment. Let's say you've got a marketing team and they want to generate an image of a, let's say, a, a robot. You want a chatbot, you're going to give it a face. The image you see on the screen here is what your marketing team is sitting there creating with one of these AI models. Now, what happens if you start, you set on this? Everybody loves it. The, the, um, the business decides we're going to invest in this. This is the face of our chatbot. Now, after five years where this thing has gotten a whole personality and a whole backstory and, 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 and we've created a whole theme around this, there's an infringement and you want to rely on copyright infringement. What, what do you do then? How do you prove your ownership of that copyright? Remember, you've made that significant investment in building that brand around this entity or this equity. And remember, it could be anything. It could be a logo. It could be a slogan. It could be absolutely anything. But there remains this fundamental risk in ownership, which may come back to bite you if you try to enforce. So a next question that comes up is, can you, if you create something like that, protected as a trademark. Now you've got to look at, at the terms and conditions very carefully. And, and, and here I can actually share with you a bit of a war story. So this wasn't a matter where a client created an, an, a visual equity with, with AI, but they went to a library of images and they bought something they wanted to use. Bought is the wrong word. They, they, they paid for a commercial license to use that particular image. And in this case, it was part of a much bigger campaign, but that image would become instrumental to building that small brand out to something very significant. It was something that had feet way beyond South Africa. So it was a, a solution that had, had, had scope to be uh, delivered in multiple international jurisdictions. And then ENS received instruction to protect this particular image as a trademark. And we were in the process of looking at classification, jurisdictions, Cost proposals were prepared already. And as a team, we, we, we realized, but let's go back and see where this image comes from. So trying to trace the copyrights in the image, we found the terms or conditions of this particular 
provider and lo and behold, it pre prevents you, even if you have a commercial license, to protect that image as a trademark. And, and that's the world in which we find ourselves. So when your marketing teams are excited and creating new content and, and new equities for you, just remember those terms and conditions must be properly understood to understand when you can use a tool to build a long-term high value equity or something that's gonna be used for two weeks and then discard it. So how do we manage this risk within businesses? And the first thing is we need to tell people about it. At the moment, people are excited and they should be excited and they should not be reined in and they should be allowed to use these tools in my view. But they need to understand what the context, so the legal context of what they're doing is. To what extent if I generate a piece of code from an AI, does that go back into that system to be part of the training of that same system to create the same piece of code, maybe to articulate it differently for my competitor? To what extent can I own the equity? To what extent can I actually derive the value from this intellectual property asset that I've created? So training is very important, not to inhibit your creatives in organizations, but in fact, to enable them to better decide how and when to use those tools. And that leads to the next point, how we, how we mitigate this risk. Guidance on the types of projects and works, ooh, typing error there, um, where AI tools can be used. So, so remember, if you've got something where you are working on a piece of code that is security related and you're a financial institution, AI is perhaps not the best place to go and place around, best place to go and play around to find the solution. And your teams should be guided what type of AI and for what kind of use cases it would be appropriate to do so. So I alluded to this already. Let's say we are building a campaign. We want the image of a beautiful girl interacting with a ball and she's excited because her team just won. This is the type of, of command you put into some of this AI so that they generate an image for you and you continue refining that. And the idea is this is gonna be a short-term three-month campaign. The risk would hopefully be low, depending on what the terms and conditions says, but you haven't built an equity that you think this is gonna be the next five-year thing for my business. The flip side of that is if you're building something where you think this is gonna be this new metaverse logo for me, I'm using AI to create it, and I'm gonna run with this and invest in it. It's gonna become a key brand for us in the future then AI may not be the best place to do that, 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 that creative work for the final product. So that kind of practical guidance may be relevant to the business. And as I said before, not to rein them in, but to rather help them to make the correct creative decisions for the business. Remember that second slide that I showed you about that red arrow going up, intellectual property as a proportion of total asset value. The work the creatives in the business are doing the tech developers, the marketing guys, the, the, the people finding new ways to reach customers and clients. We must enable them, not inhibit them, but we must guide them on how we can own those assets. And then very importantly, in my view, with the world changing in this way, new provisions in third-party contracts may actually become quite important. So for example, if we draft an agreement dealing with software development, We've got clauses in there saying, listen, if you're going to touch third party software or you're going to touch any open source software, you've got to get my approval first to do that. And if, if you do that, th these are going to be the rules. Shouldn't we have something like that for AI as well? If you're going to use an AI tool to build a visual equity for me, you've got to get my approval first. I have to say, yes, it's okay to do that. Otherwise, I've got exactly the same copyright ownership problem that I would have had if my own marketing team did this. Warranties and indemnities. Maybe we need to tweak them to actually speak to this change in the world as well. So, so remember, we're talking about risk here, about risk mitigation. And here, I think, are a nice set of very basic things to do and to think about to help the business to be able to actually engage with these tools and successfully use them. So... If we take this whole idea of helping the business a little bit further, 
my apologies for the noise, and that may actually continue now for a while. I hope you can still hear me. Um, first of all, on those three first three categories, when we look at training and guidance, a place where you can directly address this would be something like your IP policy. If you have an IP management framework, that's an ideal place to build in guidance of this nature. And very importantly, intellectual property with respect to, to your employees and how you manage that from a policy point of view becomes very important. So hopefully you have some kind of intellectual property policy for employees. You need to amplify that now. And you need to say, but okay, traditionally we spoke about ownership, infringement, those kind of things. We know you're going to use these tools and we're going to provide you with some policy guidance on what you can and can't do. And remember, that isn't really available, and the answer definitely shouldn't be never use it. But you've got to find that nuanced approach that works for your business. New provisions in third-party contracts. We are already looking at this internally, sort of changing the way that we, we, we approach some of these matters. You need to go back to the office and think, okay, wait a minute. Do I need to look back at my templates, at my model clauses, and tweak some of them to adapt to this new world? So remember, I said sort of earlier on that, that for you, you may think that this problem between the data and the AI, so the, the learning data, is a, a problem that, that isn't that close to home for you. And the answer to that is yes and no, perhaps more no than you think. What do I mean with that? Now, you will know the, the Chinese uh, fashion retailer online, Shein, and what they've done is built an extremely sophisticated artificial intelligence model that looks at a whole range of visual equities designs around the world. That system picks out designs that it, through, through predetermined algorithms, considers low or high risk. Okay, what do I mean with that? It will pick up a Nike design, for example, and it will assess that and say, well, people like it, but there's a high risk of legal action. So I'm not going to use that one, but make it fun. I'm going to use that. Have never heard of this artist. Risk to us is very low. If there is a problem, we'll 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 we'll, we'll um, try to settle it. And this particular design was sold for three dollars um, per per design by Sheen. Um, a legal action did 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 follow based on copyright infringement. How Sheen tried to deal with this is to offer a settlement of five hundred US dollars to make it go away. But the key thing here is that we're not now talking about the risk on the side of your business using it. We're talking about something different. What risk may exist for your business if competitors are able to input some of your data? into a system and get some kind of learning from that. So, so that I think is a, is a critical thing for us to think about. So if you're a fashion retailer, Shein would be a direct competitor, it would be a direct threat, and its system would be using your own online designs to learn and to assess and determine what product ranges would be um, produced and made available to customers. So, so that's a reality. To the extent that you're a, a, a FMCG company in a, in a different industry, your competitors know what you're doing already. But what you need to ask yourself is, to what extent that can they use this to preempt certain things that I am doing or to very quickly have something in the market that competes with me? And the fact that I don't have a great example or an answer to that immediately doesn't mean that it's not something that you are forced to think about. You're absolutely forced to think about that. So, but the reality here is that artificial intelligence doesn't only pose a risk to the business because your people will use it. It poses a significant risk to businesses because competitors will be able to use it. So what if competitors start using your data to develop competing products and services? Here are three things to think about. So copyright infringement claims, of course, that's going to be the first port of call. And just that you know, there are multiple cases against Sheen already. What happened in the US is there's an act called the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. It's basically an act that is was created to, to, to sort of address racketeering. And there's a case pending against Sheen at the moment on the basis that, that they have created a system 
that is fundamentally based on criminal copyright infringement in order to run their business. And not only that, from reading reports on, 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 on that case, or one of those cases specifically, the corporate structure of Sheen is so convoluted, it's very difficult to know which entity to actually take action against. And this act, act um, the, the RICO Act, specifically speaks to those type of cases as well. And then, of course, looking at this again from a South African perspective, unlawful competition would certainly be something for one to think about as a cause of action if something like this should occur. Remember, we've got that doctrine of springboarding, sort of someone unlawfully using the fruits of your labor, labor to compete against you. And, and, and I can't remember the case. I think it was the Schultz versus Bud case where the court said competition is essential to our, our world, but you must compete as a soldier, not as a gorilla. Okay, so if we move on from here, what are the, are the, are the key things that as a business you should start thinking about from a risk management point of view, there isn't a clear cut answer to this because a lot of your information is out there already. Remember, we're talking about systems that can scrub 5 billion images on the internet. I mean, start imagining how much of your data and documentation and information is out there already. Maybe it's time for all of us to rethink what we're putting out there and to look at our information management systems again. So that I'll leave as a risk mitigation comment it's not purely intellectual property at all, but it's something for you to at least at least flag within the business. Here for me is now sort of looking over the horizon and saying, okay, but what, what is possibly coming next? So the types of data typically used for training language models specifically is reported to probably run out by 2026. It means that in three years' time, two years time almost, there won't be enough data available anymore, online for example, for AI systems to enhance their, their language ability. And remember, that's a language logic system that we're talking about. Where would I go to then to train my system? Where do I find that data then? And I am carefully predicting that we are gonna see data theft, not for personal information, but for the continued ability to train AI models to be better at what they do. This takes us back to that previous slide where I said, what are the risk mitigating steps that we can take? We need to rethink about data protection. I'm not talking about personal data, general business data, how we manage that, how we disclose it, what we put out there in the world, and in this slightly longer term, two, three years away, what steps are we taking to make sure that that doesn't become a target? Doesn't become a target for for AI learning models. So this is something that that sounds a little bit futuristic. Maybe I'm 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 convinced we're going to see this in our lifetimes. Okay, so we've got about less than eleven minutes to quickly talk about NFTs. Now I'm not going to overcomplicate this at all. So what are we talking about when we talk about NFTs? An NFT is a unique digital identifier that is recorded on a blockchain and is used to certify ownership or authenticity. Okay, so it is, in your mind, you must think already, it's one thing, the NFT, that is associated with something else. It cannot be copied, substituted, or subdivided. And the ownership of an NFT is recorded in that blockchain so that you can give transfer of ownership of something. The NFTs are tokens that we can use to represent ownership of unique items. Okay, so where do we see this a lot? So OpenSea, you would have seen or may recognize this from a slide on AI as well. It's a, 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 a system where you can generate digital images, and these are sold online on a platform where the rights to the image are associated with the NFTs. And I'll, I'll try to explain this a little bit better. So how does it work? So in the middle there, you've got the NFT. That NFT is associated with what I understand to be quite a well-known digital artwork. But the NFT doesn't only have to connect to the artwork itself. Remember, there are a, or there is a set of rules that goes with your purchase of the NFT, which is the token that gives you title to the digital artwork. So when you buy the, the right to use the artwork, 
the NFT is the vehicle that gives you the legal right and associated with that NFT must be a set of rules. And I'm explaining it in this way because you're going to be confronted in your businesses with people saying, oh, we've got this great idea with NFTs. We want to do the following. And you need to be able to deconstruct that relationship between object, NFT, and set of rules that govern what can be done. So if you look at that last example on this slide, for example, where a, a tweet was sold for 3 million US dollars and the buyer of the tweet could do nothing with it. He could hold on to it, but he couldn't reprint it. He couldn't put it on t-shirts and caps and make money from it. He could show it on the screen at home effectively. So where is that governed? It's governed in the NFT that is associated with the digital object or, 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 or the artwork. So, so critically important when you're confronted with this type of arrangement is you need to understand who owns the intellectual property rights in the image or the digital equity? So if the business comes to you and say, listen, we are actually going to do the following. We're going to have a painting made that celebrates Rugby World Cup 2023. And we are going to have digital images then made of that. And we're going to sell 50 of those. Only 50. High value. And what, what can people do with it? Show it on a big digital screen at home. Are the buyers getting the copyright in this digital artwork? No, they're getting a license and it's a restrictive license. They can't make reprints and sell the reprints. They can just show it at home. That's the, how you keep the exclusivity of that. So you must understand who the right owner is to grant the rights in that relationship. Who mints the NFT? Who is the company that creates that NFT that connects with the digital artwork and that connects the rights granted by the rights owner to what the buyer can do. And then what are those rights linked to that NFT? So in my view, no magic here, but the critical thing is understanding those three different components so that when you're confronted with this question and the excitement of the brand and marketing teams about what they're gonna do with NFTs, that you deconstruct the relationship and say, I need to speak to the rights owner. I need to understand who's gonna mint the NFT for us. And then together, we're going to create the set of rules that actually moves along with the NFT when it is sold. That brings me to the conclusion of the session today. And rather than to have a few bullet points, I thought it overwhelm you with further images. But these are all familiar now. First of all, remember, we are talking about new things happening in the world, but all related to that one most important, most valuable asset class of the business, its intellectual property. And whether you think the metaverse is still out there or something to come or it's something to happen, it's happening already. Your business is probably thinking about it in any case. And if it isn't, it should be. What have you done to help the business to be ready for that from a trademark protection point of view, from a gearing up to understand infringement in the context and from the point of view of speaking to those people who want to run to the, the owners of Ubuntu land and sign the next agreement to make sure that you understand where copyright vests and who owns that. What are you doing internally to manage risks created by your people using artificial intelligence? And, and as I said earlier, you can be guaranteed people in the business are using it already. Have you trained them? Have you thought about providing them with guidance? Have you looked at your contracts, how they read with respect to third parties and AI? There's definitely nothing to be afraid of, in my opinion, but there are steps to be taken to help the business to optimize its usage of these amazing tools. And then if we look at what has happened with Shein and, and, and the very aggressive way in which it has taken the fashion world and, and, and fashion retail by storm, to what extent are you taking a quiet moment over coffee with some other colleagues in other areas of the business and thinking, are we at risk? How does this look in our world? If I'm a bank, what should I be worried about? If I'm a FMCG company, can this happen to me? What is the risk to me? Do we understand what the risk is? Because the risk definitely is there. So if nothing else, I'm hoping that this was informative to show you that these things are nothing to shy away from. A lot of the intellectual property rules and principles we have will help us navigate this world. But as people in the business, we need to better understand these different sort of 
the features of, of, the, of the world we live in now to continue to optimize those intellectual property assets for our businesses. I'm quickly going to look at the Q and A and see if I can at least try to answer one question, maybe. Um, well, though, the so first one I'm happy to take. It's from Suzette. Okay. And I'm curious to know. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me no, well. Uh, so a question from Suzette. I'm curious to know or understand where the term metaverse originates from. Um, just to let you know, it was first used in a science fiction novel published in 1992 called Snow Crash. And it's a combination of the Greek word meta, which means beyond and universe. So it actually means beyond universe. And then just a comment from Talia at MassMart to say that they ventured into the metaverse, which is good to hear. I hope that this session has been useful. Um, Waldo, there's a question on jurisdiction as well, which I think you have touched on. Can you see the questions? I can, Galen. Thank you very much. So the question on jurisdiction, I've only sort of skimmed through it quickly, but um, is definitely a difficult one. Because remember, when we talk about intellectual property rights, we're typically, typically going to be talking about trademarks and copyright in this context. Um, copyright in terms of the Berne Convention and things like the TRIPS Agreement will be protected in, in, in numerous states without the, the requirement for, for uh, registration. Um, there are those places where registration is necessary. Trademarks, of course, is a territorial concept. So jurisdiction becomes a very difficult question just on as far as the, the rights that you have to have are concerned to be able to enforce. But then where do you go to? Where do you take that action? So in the Rothschild case, it was easy because the Rothschild is a known artist in the US. Everybody knew where to find him. I anticipate that we will find infringement where it's going to be very difficult to find the infringing party. They will be hidden through all, ways, all kinds of ways of, of, of you know, hiding IP addresses and, and, and actual activities. Um, that, I think, is going to be a challenge, but it's certainly not something that we can shy away from. And it's something that we will have to take head on the steps that we can take as businesses at this stage is to say, look, I've never thought about, for argument's sake, Bulgaria is a place to protect my trademark. But you know what? Maybe that's a good place to go because there are a lot of sort of virtual type of infringement maybe coming from that jurisdiction. And only time will learn a little bit more. So, so a very good question. Unfortunately, don't have a silver bullet answer to that one. Um, then... Ryan Tucker asked the question, does a claimant require a U.S. copyright registration to enforce under the RICO Act? Um, Ryan, as far as I know, copyright comes into existence in the U.S. automatically. So the registration there is not something that creates a right. It is something that's required as a prerequisite to enforcement action. So although I'm not that familiar with the RICO Act and you probably need more, more, more practical guidance, um, the answer there is, I do suspect you're going to need to do a registration, but remember, the registration doesn't create the right. It sets you up for enforcing that right. I hope that answers the question. We have one minute to spare. Thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate you making the time to join us, and we really hope that this was useful.